I've usually shied away from games of my childhood to prevent nostalgic blindness from affecting my reviews, but today I'm negating all that for Driver. Released in 1999 by Reflections and GT Interactive Games, it was released on the PlayStation 1. Why? Well, to be fair, I've never really given Driver a fair play, even though I've probably owned it since I was about 9 years old. My childhood jam was instead its sequel, aptly named Driver 2, and I've probably played that about 3 times over the years. But, I guess today of Driver, I'll finally be getting my $19.95 worth. You might be wondering why I never really played the original over Driver 2, and the answers to that aren't really all that surprising. For one, Driver 2 is just plainly a better game. For instance, you can get out of the car, and among other quirks, it's also a bit more engaging. However, there can't have been a Driver 2 until there was a Driver 1, so let's delve in and find out how the series that eventually had 8 games over 15 years initially began. The story, quite frankly, is either kind of boring or a bit too silly. Today, gentlemen, we killed a president. I commend the game for the number of cutscenes included, however, as it was fairly out of the ordinary for the time. There are 44 story missions all up, and most of these have cutscenes in between them. Having said that though, the story was fairly basic and felt contrived. This is in stark contrast to Driver 2's plot, which was all kinds of awesome. Well, to kid version of me anyway. But you know what? That's okay. This is a driving game after all, and a great plot isn't expected of it, especially since later games actually did have decent stories to tell. For the sake of clarity, however, the plot involves a detective named John Tanner. Since he was originally a race car driver, he is chosen to go undercover to infiltrate the gangs, masquerading as a driver for them. It's based in the 1970s, so it's clear that inspiration has been taken from car chase flicks of that era. This assignment of Tanner covers the cities of Miami, San Francisco, Los Angeles and New York, all of which are fully open and explorable cities in-game. The main bread and butter of Driver is the undercover mode, which is where the story missions reside. Before you can play through those, however, you must pass something called the interview. More or less a tutorial stage, a bunch of driving manoeuvres must be performed in an underground car park before time runs out. This is surprisingly difficult, and I'm astonished I beat it as a child. On the first try, I thought maybe this was the reason I didn't play it much when I was young, but further in I was recognising missions, so I guess I did originally pass it. Either that or my dad did it for me. Luckily though, this tutorial level can be practised, and there is even a video showing which buttons must be pushed for each manoeuvre, so at the very least the game does lend a helping hand, but it does make you wonder how many people tried Driver and gave up after they couldn't even complete the tutorial. Even though there is a large amount of missions, variety sadly isn't that common. Most missions involve either escaping the cops, getting to a location in a time limit, or pursuing another driver and ramming them until they can be rammed no more. Some missions even time how long it takes you to get from one point to another, which I found a bit odd. I'm not really sure what the point of that was. Do you keep the high score and show it off to like-minded friends? Who knows? There are a few levels that introduce new mission types at least, although these are far and few between. For instance, an early mission has you driving around Miami and smashing your car into shop window fronts as a kind of protection racket threat. Regardless of the missions mostly being same sammy, they are at least fun. The handling of the vehicles is quite good, and handbraking around corners and doing burnouts never gets old. The missions as a whole are fairly tricky though, and the times given can sometimes feel downright cruel, but the plus side, you do get unlimited redos for each mission. Additionally, you can also save your progress to a memory card between each mission as well. Driving around the expansive environments, each vehicle you drive has a felony and damage meter. The damage meter is self-explanatory. If you bust up your wheels too much, it's game over. I guess that was a big revelation of Driver 2. If you shitted up your car too much, you could simply get out and steal a brand new one. No such feature was available in this game yet though. If that meter hits capacity, then you'll have to start again. The felony meter on the other hand, fills up as you do naughty things in front of the police. The rules are stricter here than for similar open world driving games. Breaking laws such as speeding, driving through red lights and on the wrong side of the road will draw heat. The more of that you draw and the more the meter fills up, the more the cops will search for you and they'll start forming roadblocks. The game somewhat indicates that you can simply stop behaving when you pass a cop to avoid their nuisance, although this is basically impossible considering the time limits given for most missions. Most of these require you to speed and drive like a maniac. If you drive responsibly then you'll never make your destination in time. Police presence is something you'll want to start cozying up to regardless. They're going to be a major part of the game no matter how you attempt to drive. Luckily for us gamers though, the AI for the police are, hmm, let's say primitive. The game is from 1999 after all. The method of taking you down mainly consists of ramming you from oncoming traffic. 
Many times, however, this is their downfall, as they'll usually miss, if you swerve a little bit anyway, and continue straight into a wall or another car. If they're behind you, then driving on the wrong side of the road usually takes care of them as well. It won't be too long until they collide with something. It should be noted that a few missions require you to escape from the cops though, and the missions won't be completable until they're not chasing you. This will require them to be out of your sight for a long enough period, although the more your felony meter is filled, the more prevalent they'll be. Having said that though, you can also smash into and disable them, which can work in a pinch as well. A few times I actually let them smash into me if I arrived at the location and their attendance was not required. I only did this if I had plenty of health of course, but it was amusing to sit on the spot where the mission finished, waiting for them to smash into me continuously until they incapacitated themselves. Since each city environment is quite large, there is a mini map in game as well as a larger map that can be accessed from the pause menu. That large map is very useful if you need to get somewhere in a hurry. It will show your location, as well as where you need to go. I checked this regularly while driving so I could determine the quickest route. There was no turn by turn navigation in the 70s after all. My only pet peeve of this map was how it's accessed. I wish there was a button on the controller that was mapped to quick view it, possibly the select button, as having to go through the pause menu each time was such a drag. The minimap is useful for other reasons, while not really that great for navigation since it only shows a small portion of the map, the police do show us white dots, meaning that you'd know where they're around if you wanted to start driving normally. When they're actively chasing you too, a large cone protrudes from the white dots which represents their field of vision. Handy if you're close to the end of a mission where they can't be chasing you and you want to avoid them. As well as the main story mode, there is also a handful of minigames based around driving. Unlocked as you progress through the story, they mainly consist of the type of missions in the undercover mode. There are a few standouts though. For one, there is Trailblazer, where there is a route of markers that increase the time limit every time one is collected. Standard fare, but fun nonetheless. There is also Dirt Track, which are time trials out in the desert. It's fun to perform handbrakies around the corners on the slippery ground while avoiding hitting things, as this will add time, and the change of scenery is also welcome. Otherwise, there is a game called Survival, where the idea is to try and last as long as possible while a bunch of really fast and damaging cop cars single you out. It's a bit ridiculous. There's also a mode called Take a Ride. Here you can explore each city and do whatever you please. You can even drive responsibly and follow the road rules if you want. All in all, I'm glad these extra game modes are here. Any extra playtime is always welcome. Driver represents itself quite well. The main menu cycles through a nice illustration that changes as you scroll, and the menu for the undercover mode is a 3D interactive room that changes depending on where you're at in the story. To choose missions for instance, there is an answering machine, with each message likely being a mission. Be warned though, I found that if you just kept playing the mission of the first message every time, other missions that aren't the first message are skipped entirely. Quite lame really, and not something I realised until a decent way into the game. The four cities in game are expansive, and were quite cutting edge on the PlayStation at the time. In fact, the developers had to create their own CD streaming software for all of it to work. While the graphics might not seem like much on first glance, the more you look, the more you realise that a fair amount of detail is included. It's very easy to tell which city is emulating which real life location, and if you stop driving around quickly for a moment, you'll notice all the little details included. The only downfall of the cities is that there are no curved roads. Everything is at a 90 degree angle. This is great if you like using the handbrake, but it can make navigating a bit tiresome sometimes. Luckily, this is something that was fixed in Driver 2. The music is pleasant as well, really capturing that 70s car chase movie vibe. Although, I recommend playing around with the audio levels before starting. By default, the sound effects drown everything out. The voice acting was quite good as well, which is an oddity for many games of the era. That doesn't save it from the usually lame dialogue though. While there are some obvious limitations, Driver awakened the series to the right side of the bed. If you don't own a PlayStation, it was also ported to the PC as well as the Game Boy Color. While the PC version is more or less the same, the Game Boy Color version is presented in a top-down fashion because of the hardware, kind of like with GTA. I haven't played that myself, although it did score fairly well at the time. Besides from a free-to-play smartphone game released in 2014 about speedboat racing, Driver hasn't seen a proper release in the series since 2011. That was for Renegade 3D, released on the Nintendo 3DS. Funnily enough, I threw together a small written review for that on my blog last year. The review is not great, I think I wrote it in about an hour, but if you're interested in the game then maybe check it out. I'll left a link in the description box down below. 